Hi everyone, this is Larry Welch again coming to you from uh, the Transportation Institute down at Texas A&M. We've got a fantastic uh, guest speaker today, but before I get to introduce him, just want to remind you that uh, please uh, mute your devices. We do have a chat box. If you'd like to uh, type in a question, just type it in that chat box and I'm monitoring that and we'll try to answer your question during the, the broadcast. Also, we want to remind you that our MAPS conference, that's Managing Asphalt Pavements, will be February 12th and 13th, 2020, in San Marcos, Texas at the NBC Suite. So look forward to that. Mark your calendars. We do have some things up on our website. You can look that up. Uh, we do uh, also do the webinars every third Thursday of each month. Uh, next month will be an exception. We're going to do it on the 14th. We had a little scheduling conflict with our guest speaker. We're going to be talking about liquid asphalts in uh, November and December. So it'll be a two-part webinar. So put that on your calendar to be a part of that. Uh, anytime you got any questions about some asphalt pavements, please just give the center a call and they'll take your name and phone number down and give me a call and I'll call you back. Uh, we really appreciate all the interest uh, that people have been attending these webinars. We keep getting bigger and bigger crowds each month, and we'll continue to do these and uh, probably broaden our range of expertise with other people. We do record the webinars, so there is a library on our website. You can go back and visit any one of these and listen to them again. So. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Charles Gaganis, right? Gerganis. Gerganis. I almost close. got it. I Did tried to practice Larry. too many times. <laughs> Again, uh, Charles is an engineer, uh, doctor, degree. Uh, I sometimes figure out how to say that, but um, he's down here at TTI. We're in the new Relis Center, beautiful complex. And so we're going to start off. Charles, just kind of introduce yourself a little bit, and you can just take off with it. Sure. And we'll go. Well, thanks, Larry. So. Appreciate your time this morning. Uh, a little bit of history on me is before I came to TTI in this world of research engineer, I was an area engineer for the Texas Department of Transportation up in the East Texas area. So I finished out at TxDOT as the Longview Area Engineer, so right there um, in far Northeast Texas. So I do, have, all of my degrees are from right here at Texas A&M. So um, that's kind of a brief history on me. If, you, if any of you were at, the TechSAPA annual conference. This presentation will look very familiar to you. We talked a lot about perpetual pavements in Texas down there. So we'll jump right into it. And again, like Larry mentioned, if you if you would like to ask a question, just go ahead and put it post it there in the chat and we'll try to get around to to answering it as we as we go through it. So the question with perpetual pavements is what do we really mean by it, particularly in the flexible pavement world, right? Um, what we're really looking for here is a long-lasting HMA pavement structure. And when we say long-lasting, we're talking about service life in excess of 50 years without major structural rehabilitation. We say service life of, of more than 50 years because we, we talk in service lives in engineering. But if you, I'm sure many of you on the call are managers of networks and you know that in reality, um, that service life is just something that we designed for, that that 50 years can come and go and you still have to maintain or manage that pavement. And in fact, a lot of us with the infrastructure system that we inherited um, are facing situations where that infrastructure has lived for 50 or 60 years and we're getting to a point where, hey, we need to think about major structural rehabilitation. And so you can kind of start to tie in this perpetual pavement with not just greenfield construction, but if we're really going to have to go back and rebuild something that is 40, 50, or 60 years old, let's think about rebuilding it in a way that's there for somebody else 40, 50, or 60 years from now without major structural rehabilitation, and let's do it out of flexible pavements. Sometimes we say, hey, we're going to leave our children something that Hopefully we won't have to work on. That's right, and so may and and hopefully for some of us it can even be grandkids, right? At this That's point. True. So That's true. now we should, we don't need to kid ourselves. We it, anytime you build something, just like a home, right? You build a home and you say we want it to last for 50, 60, 100 years. 
you have to put a new roof on it. You have to put a new coat of paint on it. You may have to fix some siding or something like that. In, in the perpetual pavement world, you, there's going to be surface maintenance that's going to be required. And fortunately, on the flexible side of things, we have a lot of surfaces that are, uh, they're, they're resilient and they help meet our needs, whether it be from a rainfall perspective or a, a great wearing course in terms of friction and different things like that. And they're the, they're the same surfaces that you end up overlaying your concrete pavements with as well. So um, there, there will be surface maintenance, but we have a lot of good options there. So what we wanna do is we wanna resist those structural distresses that are down deep, that cause us lots of big problems. Um, and then we wanna make sure they're also durable so that they can withstand traffic and the environmental damage. And so that we're putting good surfaces on the top of it as well. Here's just a little schematic of kind of what we're looking for. This actually comes straight out of TxDOT's design guide where we're looking at an, an inch and a half to three and a half inches of renewable HMA surface. I would say now with our flexible pavements, we're really, we really have the ability to lay those at an inch and a half. Um, the, there's no reason to lay three and a half inches of mix on top that you think you're going to have to mill out. We can, we can lay some mixes out there at an inch and a half. And in fact, we're even thinning some stuff down now and, and approaching an inch on a few things. Then we have a very stiff uh, rut resistant zone, uh, definitely gonna be thicker than six inches of hot mix. And that's where we're really dispersing that load getting it out so that when we get down to the interface between our unbound layers, we're not pushing on those unbound layers that are softer. We're not pushing on them so hard that they start to, to flex and we create that void that leads to that crack. That Charles, is, is, is this area that we've got labeled C, is this where we're lacking a little bit maybe for the stiffer mixes? I think so. Or it, maybe the stiffer mixes um, or making sure you have enough depth so that before you get on top of that unbound layer, you spread that load out far enough that those softer layers underneath are, are in good shape. And, and we'll talk a little bit more about design at the end when we get into maybe needing to stabilize some of those layers and stiffen up some of that unbound stuff. But these are, these are four perpetual pavement sections that were built in, on I-35 in the Laredo district. And we're gonna spend quite a bit of time talking about what's been put out there because in the early 2000s, TxDOT made a concerted effort to try to build some of these perpetual pavements. And in fact, they overbuilt um, a lot of them in terms of thickness. And we'll kind of look at that when we go through the plans. So if any of you guys are from down in the Laredo area, these sections probably look familiar. They're all along I-35. We'll start at the, the southernmost one there just north of Laredo and take a look at kind of what it looks like. So this project was let in 2003 and they finished building it in 2008. So we're looking at a project that's been in service for a little over a decade now. You can see that the Eagleford shell play and the energy sector boom that has occurred in that part of the world has shifted what they thought about traffic back in 2003, where they thought the 2021 ADT was going to be about 35,000 vehicles per day. You can see the 2017 ADT, that's a current uh, value from the statewide planning map. They've already far exceeded that. And we're looking at 34% uh, in terms of truck traffic. That's and well over double what it was anticipated in 2001. That's exactly right. So in its, it were, they're actually quite fortunate that they did build this section out of a perpetual pavement because if they had not, the energy sector traffic, the energy sector trucks that have pounded this section of roadway, um, they would have broken up a thinner section uh, in a heartbeat. Tore it up. They would have. And we'll look at a little bit of performance, but let me just preface it by saying that they've had to do a little bit of work down here, but everything's been in the surface. So they haven't had to do that major structural rehabilitation. So even though there's just been this boom of traffic and very heavy truck traffic, they haven't had to go in and rebuild that flexible perpetual pavement. They've been able to do all of their uh, resurfacing work in the top two inches. And that really saves us money. We did our homework up front, even though our traffic count is really exceeded. That's right. We built a perpetual pavement. We can just, it's like putting new shingles on your roof of your house. That's right. Very minimal cost. 
the traffic's not impacted very much and we're on our way again. It is, and in this energy sector traffic is similar to you getting a hailstorm. There you go. Right? I mean, it's sometimes you got to do things sooner than you wanted like to do that. them, but but your house is still in good shape, right? That's right? Put a new roof on it, but your house is in good shape. And That's right. In reality, this section is not super thick. We're looking at 13 and a half inches of total HMA. Um, and just so you guys can kind of compare it, that this type of traffic, you would probably be looking in Texas at least, something similar to a 13 inch CRCP with a double mat of steel. So we're probably about inch for inch in a in a perpetual HMA section, and then we have six inches of flex base underneath that. And the great thing about asphalt is we can lay it today, you can drive on it today. That's exactly right. That's right. Do speed, that with concrete. Speed of construction is uh, is a very big deal, and only becoming more and more important. This was just I just wanted to kind of paint this picture of when this this roadway was built and the drilling permits in Webb County. Uh, so this is down close to Laredo. We're going to look at some of those other sections that are a little bit closer to Catula, and you're going to see that the boom in that part of the world was really significant. Just to kind of paint the picture, this if you if you kind of guess uh, the amount of loading that each well provides, and you take a look at those drilling permits, you find out that in that five-year period. Uh, at a conservative estimate would have been we've already experienced a third of the wow. design load just in that five-year period mm -hmm. alone. So the oil companies are not always exactly um, forthcoming about the trucks it takes to build a well. So <laughs> it may even be closer to a half, but uh, wow. but it's definitely a, a lot of loading in a short period of time. And overall, You're bringing the equipment in to do these wells. It, it is, and then you know because it's a fracking situation down there, the amount of water that's being hauled across right. the roads, and and then of course you get into dynamic loads, and we can all get that. really nerdy with all of that stuff. But <laughs> like the it. fact is, is it, it pounded that pavement pretty good. There you go. Then just so to kind of paint the picture in terms of of performance of what's going on out there. Uh, this is TxDOT's metric, the condition score. So this is that metric that gets reported to the legislature every time those guys come in and try to meet that good or better goal. Right. The good value is 70. Any roadway that has a condition score of 70 or higher is considered good. You can see by and large, this section of this section of 35 has remained good the whole time that it's been in service. Starting to see it slide a little bit now, but it's all in some surface issues. And we can see that right here. You can see in 2016, you started to see a little bit of shallow rutting occurring. What is shallow rutting, just so we all know out there? That's between a quarter inch and a half an inch of rutting. So it's- um, Very minimal, but it, still noticeable. It's noticeable. It's noticeable enough for us as pavement folks to start thinking about it. Um, you probably couldn't see it with the naked eye. True. Um, but it is, this is where you start getting into, well, hey, our, our um, our surface has been out there now going on 10 or 11 years. Maybe it's time to do something to it. The Laredo district's being proactive. They actually, I believe, just let a contract and they're going to mill this off and replace it. So you're looking at, by the time they get it laid down and everything, about 12 years of that surface life. And then they'll come back in and get things fixed up. So this is just a little bit more of the performance data. Uh, it, it turns out, and the only reason I wanted to show this is because it's, you see those two blue lines that that fall way off? It turns out that that's a, a concrete test section that's right in the middle of the flexible perpetual pavement. And it has gone it below is, the good it line. It has gone, gone below the good line. And it's been out there a little bit longer. I think it was built in the late 90s. Um, wow. The point is just that when we manage our pavements, that there is no such thing as a pavement that you don't have to manage. That's right. You got to think about how you're going to build these things and keep moving them and forward. And by that line, it failed pretty drastically over a couple of just three years. Right. So it, and you can see it started to slide a little bit in, in 2010 and um, mm -hmm. probably as an in effect to some, some truck traffic that was going on there. Gotcha. Yep. So here are the other three sections that are out there in Laredo. You can see they were all built in the early 2000s. The section two was completed there in 2005. And if, we won't go back to that first map, but if you think about it, we're moving from south to north. So 
Section three is just south of Catula. Section four is just north of Catula. And you can see these sections were constructed quite a bit thicker. And again, it's probably served them well. Going through, as we've gained some knowledge in our materials and the design process over the last 15 years, uh, we can design and do better with perpetual pavements than this thickness. They don't necessarily have to be this thick, but it serves these guys well. If you look at section four, uh, 2002 ADT, so when they put these plans together, 6,600 vehicles a day. They projected out by 2022 of, 23, of, of 11,200. Because of the Eagle for Shell play, the current ADT out there is over 23,000, and the truck traffic's almost 44%. I tell you, that's a large truck value, and most of those trucks are running at at least 80,000 pounds, if not overloaded. You know, and that's a direct route. Uh, we all know about the NAFTA agreement that Bush Sr. Uh, implemented, and uh, we get a lot of traffic coming from uh, Mexico, bringing goods and services up here. I know that Dodge car I have out there, all those panels are made in Mexico, and they're shipped up north to assemble the car, so there's a lot of traffic. And I think something else that you hit on earlier, was uh, when you and me were talking this morning, these are more remote areas. Mm -hmm. And if we build these perpetual payments, because it costs more money to go to these remote areas and do simple repair work each day or something, we built perpetual payments. We don't have to travel 60, 80 miles out there just to look at something and see what's happening. Yeah, no, I think that's exactly right. I think there's a couple of points with that, that if we can, if we can build it once right, then the life cycle cost of it clearly goes down because we're not eating up fuel costs to go back out there. We don't have to figure out how to truck mix, right. you know, 20 or, 30, 20 or 30 miles nor more than normal, normal, just one way, right? And I like that. You yeah. dead head longer. And then <clears throat> the other point I think that's worth mentioning is 35 is a freight corridor. So if we look at the economy that flows through that, if we oh, look at 35 yeah. like a pipeline of the dollar value of commerce that flows through that, and for every hour that that commerce has to wait because we're out there doing maintenance or we're out there having to do more work is time is money, right? And that's the dollar amount. So um, it, it, it obviously ends up getting passed on at some point to- Start with our owner. asphalt payment, how about that? That's right, exactly. So we'll, we'll take a look at some, some more performance data. I'll try not to bore you too much with it and, and spend a lot of time, but this really shows what happened in the Catula area where drilling permits in 2002 to 2005 where they weren't where they when they were building these perpetual pavements there was no, essentially nothing going on and then you can see the spike between 2010 and 2014 where you're looking at over 12.7 million easels in five years that that really just hammered this pavement this is the condition score that's going on out there right now. You can see that overall on 35, the condition, we have one kind of poorly behaving section, but by and large, uh, this condition, the, these roadways have held up quite well. The, I think we've got, yeah, th this poorly performing section, just want to mention it again, because this, this project was a project where they built some of it full width all the way across as a perpetual pavement. And then in other spots, they just widened 35 to the inside. I see. And they widened with perpetual pavement, but then they just overlaid the rest of the roadway. Uh, with, it, was, it was a thick overlay, five and a half inches of mix. But the section that got rated was outside of the perpetual section. And so it's, it's seeing some, some distress, but it doesn't have that full structure all the way to the bottom like some of these other sections do. But that's good that they did that because now we can monitor something that was kind of a modified it is. perpetual pavement area. That's right. And we noticed, man, it's not real bad right. for the way that it was constructed. And we learned from that. That's also. right. That's exactly right. So you can see these, these conditions. The section, this is uh, section number three. This is the one just south of Catula. It's performed really well. I do want to point this out because this is an example of what that energy sector did to these guys. These are IRI values. So here we're talking about pavement smoothness. You go to 2010 and you can see by and large your IRIs are somewhere around 60 for most of your sections. So just point of reference, anything below 75 is considered smooth. 
Um, 60 would be considered really smooth, though I will have to point out, we do a lot of ride verification monitoring here at TTI, and we're seeing flexible pavements on a norm being built in the 40s. Wow. And some of, some of contractors out there are building stuff in the 30s now. Um, but you can see there was a spike. Certainly the energy sector right around 2014 wreaked havoc. Yes. The surface got really beaten up. So they overlaid the roadway in 2015. Milled off two, put two back. And now you can see we've got IRI values down around 40, under 60. They've been tracking that way for the last five years. And we've had no major structural failures on, on this section of roadway. And Charles, if I remember right, I think that's about 2015 when we went to a lot of SMA mixes for surface mixes down in that area. They did move to SMA mixes down there. So and it is a double-edged sword for folks in that part of the world, right? The Eagleford shale play did start to come down a little bit at that time. There's been some oil price changes. Right. That certainly helped out a little bit from a road infrastructure standpoint, though makes those folks a lot of money down in that part of the world That's too. Right. So here's section number four. It's been a little more sporadic in terms of condition score. You can see, and this is again, 2014, we see the condition scores plummet. This is really the peak of the Eagle for play there in terms of drilling permits. Uh, they ended up having to mill off the top out there in 2004 and put a new surface on it, um, which so we're, we're seeing, uh, we saw them, you know, go out and mill the top of it off and the condition store goes back up there right after that. This is just kind of a, a what's going on out there. There was a little bit of alligator cracking. This is one of the few sections where we saw what we thought might have been some real uh, structural delaminations, or, or some, I'm sorry, not delaminations, but some real structural distress. And we thought, man, why is this happening to us in a perpetual pavement? Well, we got out there and it, that, that alligator cracking was occurring with no deflection. So oh, wow. we, we weren't seeing rutting either. And so, you know, whether it be just how much those high shear tires in those trucks were causing havoc, maybe, maybe we, maybe we could have designed our surface mix a little bit better had we known we were going to see that kind of traffic. And again, we don't know what the max loads are because they have no, uh, yeah. they can haul as much weight as they want in the United States via the NAFTA agreement. Now that got some, ties to it. I don't know all the ends, but I mean, some of those trucks can be well over 120,000 pounds. They can, and and that's right, and, and maybe not necessarily permitted. And so right. what it boils down to is the raiders that went out there rated this as alligator cracking, which we typically think of as a structural distress. Um, but something different was going on, and, and we didn't do enough forensics to really point to exactly what's going on, if there was some stripping issues or something like that. Right. Um, we, so again, anytime you, I think if any of you are from that part of the world, or if you know anybody down there, they can tell you what it looks like. And there's pictures floating around out there of just energy sector trucks lined up sitting on the, on the roadway. But the bottom line is we're still able to drive on these roads normally. That's right. Without any, uh, downtime via repairs or anything like that. That's right. Because it's very minimal. It's more of some distress than anything. It's not structurally just falling apart. No, that's right. I mean, it's, it's you know, milling a top off and laying it back is a whole lot different than having to exactly. get rid of eight or 10 inches of pavement structure. So, seeing a little bit of shallow rutting occurring out there right now as well, but nothing, nothing real significant. So, hey, here's another section that um, brings us into the middle of the state a little bit, New Braunfels. Uh, right there on I-35, right in New Braunfels, a, a Section roadway was constructed, finished in 2007, built very thick, but it's carrying over, it's currently carrying over 120,000 cars a day. And there's also a lot of haul trucks that go through there. There's a lot of quarries out to the west of 35. The rock goes up and down the highway. So uh, that was a concern at the point of design also. That's right. So this roadway done in 2007, you go back and look at the last 10 years, Condition score still remains above 80 on every section that's out there. That's right. It's done really well. We're starting to see a little bit of longitudinal cracking out there, but I actually don't think that's what's happening. Mm -hmm. And I'll show you that in a couple of pictures. You know, they did have one car that caught fire, and they kind of repaired that area. It makes the asphalt look bad, but it, 
it's just a repair. Right. Structurally still sound. That's you just right. Got to get that goo off the top of the car catch and those things are going to happen from time to time. That's right. Exactly right. Uh, very little shallow rutting going on look at out that. there. Just almost just, non-existent. That's right. So if you take a look at it, this is what that section looks like. So 2007, this surface has been in place for about 12 years. And I think one of y'all's members told me they just let a contract to put a new surface on I there. I think so. And I think that's actually what's going on out there. We'll zoom in here in a, in a second. You can tell though, by and large, carrying 120,000 cars a day, this mix still looks really good. You can kind of start to see in that outside wheel path, in that right lane, uh, maybe a little bit of distress showing up. Maybe but, some rocks pulling loose. Pulling loose. And, and I actually think you can see it better in this picture. So that longitudinal cracking that showed up actually showed up when TechStop made a shift to automated distress collection. And I think that automated distress is seeing that rock coming loose as longitudinal cracking. That's because there's no uh, there's no seal joints done on there's, this project. That's right. And so, so we, the new data probably did show that. Yes, that. and you can you can see that makes sense, right? If a camera sees that, it probably thinks it's a crack. But Charles, those are great pictures you got. It's really showing. And these are very recent. We went down yeah. and took these, and we went down and visited this site in August and took some of these pictures. And you know, you can see that it's about time to start thinking about a new surface. But at 120,000 cars a day, and we're looking at it's going to be out there 12 years. And like you were talking with me this morning, the asphalt's doing exactly what it's supposed to be doing. This, this is a this is a success story in terms of perpetual oh, payments man. from a structure standpoint and a surface standpoint. We've got two more on I-35, so you got to give TechStock credit. When they pick sections to to build, they didn't pick an easy roadway to to build them on. One of them is just north of the loop in Waco, and then the Y there in Hillsboro where I-35 and I-35W split, so you can head up to the DFW Metroplex. You know, they've been doing a lot of work on 35 through the whole state, but that section at the Y and just north of the loop in Waco sit as they were, and they sit that way because of the perpetual pavement that was constructed yeah. there. You think about the, where that curves in there, there's a lot of lateral distresses with the vehicles, the loading and stuff, but it's still performing perfectly. It's doing what we want it to do, that's right. And when you look at the truck traffic that's out there as well, this was actually one of the most challenging designs in terms of easels, because we're talking about uh, 90,000 cars a day, but almost 32% trucks. So again, you get a lot of quarry, a lot of quarry hauling mm -hmm. in that part of the world. And um, just, you know, Waco's kind of a, a hub there for- Y'all can see those numbers traffic. there in the middle of the page. That's right. And, uh, uh, the current percent trucks, my goodness, 32%. 32%. That's a lot. We're talking about a section that's been in service for 15 years. Now, it condition score hasn't moved from almost perfect. Wow. So it's never fallen. 90 to 100 is considered very good. So, And you can see some of that new data collection may have contributed to one of those it, going down. That, there, that, that's right. It could be. And so TechStot's still learning this automated data collection and, and right. what how that impacts it. Here's some examples of it. I, this this is another huge success story. Again, starting to see some surface. I I combed TechSot's construction records and could not find a construction project that showed another surface going on this in the last 15 years. Right. So my assumption is that that's the original surface that was placed out there. So we would naturally expect ourselves to have to mill this off and put something back. And just to point that out, that's the thermal plastic that is cracked, not the asphalt. That's right. And the white stripe there. So uh, we've had some people call me before and go out there and oh no, that's not the asphalt distress. That's the thermal that's, plastic. That's right. And all that's going to yeah, the you sunlight's going to do things. To you that can oxidation. You, you can see it on this too. You can see right. that the thermo cracking there right next to that truck. So Maybe you know, you can, it's 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 starting to open up a little bit in the pig. You can you can tell that we're we're in need of a new surface out there. But again, it's still performing quite well. No, it does well, and we still have our uh, skid values on that too. Yeah, I don't know. I didn't look very hard at that, so I'm I don't I don't remember seeing a lot of wet weather incidents right. in that that part of it. But it does bring up a good point, Larry, because when you because when you have a flexible pavement and you start thinking about resurfacing, because flexible pavements are flexible to the environment they're in, you can start to make decisions that hey, if I'm east of 35, I really need to start thinking about 
where do I apply PFC and what does that look like? Whereas maybe, hey, if I'm in, if I'm on 40 in Amarillo, maybe the the free stall properties of PFC aren't what I want. Yeah, maybe I want exactly that right. SMA out okay. there. And so you you have these options and, you know, it's just like if somebody decides they want to move from a shingle roof to a tin roof, they're not going to do it in the middle, but the next time they have the opportunity to replace their roof, that might be what that they might decide. Be a thought process. That might be what they go to. And I think that's really good good for the panhandle because they get a lot of snow. That's right. And they'll bring blades out to blade the snow. So the SMAs are performing quite well up there, but the PFCs might not be what we need because of that free stall. That's right. But they're performing excellently out in East Texas. They are. They're doing And other places, up and down 35. That's right. And we spent quite a bit of time at, at the annual conference this year talking about PFCs and showed some real success stories in major reductions in wet weather crashes due to the, exactly. the placement of PFC on some areas where they were having some problems. You know, a lot of people I talk to, they know I'm into asphalt and they'll say, hey, I drove on that road where it didn't spray out from underneath yeah. the 18 wheelers. They recognize this and they say, hey, this is great. So that even people that are not in the asphalt world know about driving cars, they know about rain, and they see this and say, that's what I want on that's my right. roads. <laughs> exactly. So here's the why up in, uh, up there in Hillsborough, just north of Hillsborough. Again, heavy traffic volume, large percent trucks, built very thick, uh, 22 and a half inches, of total HMA, 21 if you take the PFC off the top of it. Um, we we would not have to build this section this thick today, though it the amount of traffic, it, it would drive us up in the neighborhood of 14 or 15 inches of hot mix to, to handle this kind of traffic. It's been a little sporadic, but don't, don't forget to check the condition score scale there on the left. Everything is still above 70 mm -hmm. has been uh, the whole service life of it. Starting to see a little bit of longitudinal cracking occurring out there. Again, we're looking at a surface that's been out there for uh, going on a decade now. Starting to see a little bit of longitudinal rutting, uh, I'm mean, sorry, shallow rutting popping up. Again, though, after been in service about eight years and a point of reference, shallow rutting is quarter to half an inch. So it's it's not anything. Again, we all know the the traffic loads that are on 35. That's right. If we drive them, we know usually Sunday afternoon those trucks are leaving up north and coming south, and it can be a real fight getting through the traffic. So that's a lot of loading on that road. And look how it's performing. It's done great. That's right. Here's just some shots of it. Again, these are very recent photos. Surface still in pretty good shape out there. Maybe starting to show a little bit of uh, thinking about, hey, do we need to do something? And, and part of this gets into the management side of things and, and really understanding where you're building it and that sort of things. PFCs are a wonderful pavement and we're starting to see life um, 12 to 15 years in PFC exactly. surfaces. The one thing about laying a PFC surface is when you start to see it show signs, it's really time to start thinking about, hey, I want to get out there and do something else um, because it'll, it starts to lose itself a little bit in a hurry, but only after it's been out there for 12 or 15 years. And isn't it great that Charles, we can actually use our eyes to see some of this, and that's our first line of defense is noticing something's going on. That's right. And then we start monitoring it. So it just really works really well. It does, and, and that's the thing. That, that's really the success takeaway from a lot of these perpetual pavements is that by and large, even with some of the major truck traffic, the distresses have been in the surface, and that structurally, we've, we haven't seen deep rutting. We're not seeing rutting over half an inch. Oh yeah. Yeah, that's no, we're not seeing that's right. We're not seeing job. that. We're not seeing real fatigue cracking where we get that alligator cracking coming all the way from the bottom layer all the way to the top. Right. And then of course you often unite that with rutting, right? Because right. you're also getting some rutting of your subgrade layers. And we don't think about that a lot when we start getting into major structural distresses. We think, oh, what's my pavement structure that is now distressed? But a lot of times that pavement structure is distressed. Because you've done something to that unbound layer underneath, either base or subgrade, you've deflected it in a way that it's created a void mm -hmm. and you've created a crack. So when you start thinking about a rehab, unfortunately, you have to start thinking about, is it just enough to go back with pavement or do we need to get into those unbound layers and do right. something to them as well to rehabilitate those also? That's a huge design question and there's a lot to that. So don't don't go away from this thinking that I'm telling you, hey, if I've got alligator cracking, I've got to rebuild all my flex base and restabilize right. my subgrade. You may or may not have to, 
but it's something you do have to think about if you're having structural problems and we're not, and that's a good thing. You know, and, and the flex base or the underlying layer is kind of like a sponge you wash your car with. It can sit on the shelf for months and it gets really hard. And then when you put a little bit of water with it, it starts getting spongy like the word. And we can do this to our subgrades and then our asphalt will follow suit. It, that's right. And that's another key point. The, the success of perpetual pavements and actually the success of any yeah, pavement, pavement, I don't care if it's flexible or rigid, is dependent on your drainage. Right. Water is our enemy and we have to make sure it gets away from our pavement. So if, if you're having problems out there on a roadway, bef before you go through the entire design process, make sure your drainage is really good That's because right. if not, you're going to spend a lot of money. You're going to rebuild a structure only to have problems again. Same thing exactly. We've been, we've been helping. TTI has done a lot of work, honestly, recently with a lot of different districts across the state doing that very thing. They don't want to go back and relick the same thing over and over exactly. again. And then it come to find out it might be because their ditch is too shallow or too flat. And, and so we've been trying to help folks out with that as well. That's right. And it's either going to be a heavy rain or a drought, isn't it? It's seemed one way or the other, right? And it can hurt us either way. That's right. So this is a section that, that was built in the early 2000s up in the northwest side of the Fort Worth district. Um, this is something that probably could have been designed under conventional design standards, but this was a time when Texas was playing with that perpetual pavement world. And so you have 20 and a half inches of total HMA out there on a roadway that's currently only carrying 19,000 cars a day. To say the least, this section is way overbuilt, but if you take a look at it, um, its condition score is is running almost excellent. That's, right, that's exactly right. Uh, and then you take a look at it and the roadway is, I mean, it, it looks like it was built, you know, a year ago. It Nothing's going on. You're seeing no distresses at all. The only reason you know it's old is because you can tell they've replaced the RPMs right there in the, the middle. Buttons, yeah. yeah, the buttons have been replaced. It looks like they're on their third round of buttons, maybe. <laughs> and, you know, TxDOT's got a big push, and we've all got a big push about safety. And the less we have to put our people out on the roadway, the less chances of anybody getting hurt. And look at this. 15 years, or I think is what I saw. Yeah. And we don't have any repairs out That's there right. whatsoever. That's right. Now, this picture is very interesting, Yeah, this is Charles. interesting. So this, this section of State Highway 114 is a divided highway. One side, I believe it's eastbound, right. is, is flexible, perpetual pavement. Westbound is concrete. Uh, I just wanted to show this to you to, to show that there is no such thing as a distress-free pavement. Yeah, it doesn't right. matter whether it's flexible or rigid. That's right. This concrete's having some transverse cracking in it. Um, it's not significant and nobody's really worried about it, but it's built parallel to this section. And if you look at the flexible pavement, it looks really, really pretty. No and cracks No at cracks all. at all. So. Um, and it's holding the same loads. That's right, it's holding the same loads. And, and also you gotta think about this. I, the soils aren't terrible this far northwest in Fort right. Worth, but but certainly there's some some issues in the Fort Worth area that you have to think about. And those guys live with a lot of sulfate problems too. Mm -hmm. So th there's some design considerations that you need now, to think if about. If we've got some cities and counties listening to us or are going to be listening to this, you know, do your homework on the soils. That's right. Get your private lab to come out, run your proctor where you got your morse, your versus, your densities. Get them to run you some tests. Uh, run that resativity test to see if you've got the sulfates in the soil because it'll do what we call those little mole run blow ups and it'll move the stuff around and uh, you spend a lot of money for good asphalt and good preparation. You want to do that in the soil. also. Right. Def, I can't stress enough the sulfate issue because it can take it can absolutely ruin your entire pavement structure mm -hmm. and especially because stabilizing your soils that you think are going to help you can actually turn right around. And if there's gypsum in there, yes. and if there's a sulfate problem, it can do the exact opposite of what you want it to do. It's going to crater your structure. It's going to become very weak and you're going to end up with a lot of problems. So it may be a situation where normally you think, hey, I want to lime treat this or cement treat this, but the reaction that's going to be created, particularly with lime, if you have sulfate issues, it's going to do the exact opposite. Yeah. So if you're in an area with high sulfate, if you have a question about whether or not you're in an area with high sulfate, my contact info will be at the end of this. You feel free to reach out to me or, or like Larry said, you can hire you a private lab. And begin. There are some maps out there, there that are. show those concentrates. I know in the Ennis, Corsicana area, right. there's high sulfate. And that, that's what I was familiar with when I worked for Texas out in Dallas was that corridor. 
So you may uh, just look up sulfate map for Texas and right. might have the concentrate for you. Uh, you might even contact Charles here. He might yeah, send please, you yeah, we can send you something. So it's, it's very important because you don't want to spend a whole lot of good money on what is really a good pavement section mm -hmm. and have something underneath it cause you the problems that lead to the failures. And our Humpback Center also, we teach soil certification. Uh, so we know it's very important to have that as a part of our uh, basis and training and uh, certification classes so soil is important and we get it just right then we get good perpetual payment that's exactly right so moving forward this is just kind of a recap of where we are which is that we have seen some good long-term performance in texas so that we're not we're not talking theoretical anymore the the empirical evidence tells us that we can get good performance in our perpetual pavement yeah, we expect some surface distresses, but we're starting to see surfaces that are lasting out there more than a dozen years. And I like the idea of being able to tailor make your surface for the environment that you're in. Do I need PFC? Do I need SMA? Or, hey, am I just looking at a spot where I can go lay a, a what we would consider more conventional dense graded mix, right? Exactly. And it meets all the needs that I have. And then maybe I can just seal it moving That's forward, right? right? I mean, you, you, there's a lot of different things you can think about. So, you can think outside the box. You can, yeah, well, especially if you're, especially those of you that are out there thinking about how am I going to manage my network, right? From a programmatic standpoint, how is this going to help me today? But how's it going to help me when I'm managing my network in five years, 10 years? How am I going to program my job? What does a preventative maintenance program look like? And, and how do I bank some money back for right. my resurface rehabilitation type stuff? So um, I actually, to be honest with everybody on the call, I enjoy the, network management side of it as Good. much as anything so uh even more than the material side a lot of times oh i maybe. love to go out and look with people and and work with them and, and talk about what we can do and maybe save them money and it gives uh more business to our members right. of the association uh we're seeing more asphalt being laid than ever before because we're we're teaching and training making people feel comfortable with asphalt That's right. yes and and i think the users of our system enjoy it they enjoy yes. the smooth ride that comes with with an asphalt surface and oh it's much quieter it, that's right there's a lot of advantages so and we, we've developed a lot of a team things with the the smooth ride with the sound that goes away with asphalt uh concrete we still have to put the tining in to get the traction at high speeds and wet weather asphalt we're not having to do that because of the drain that we get with pfcs and the other open grade mixes uh, the SMAs have the, the more rougher surface, which so helps us. Get lots of good macro texture. And it, and it, it helps bounce that sound around of the mm -hmm. tires, and it deadens it and makes it much quieter. Uh, it just, of course, the, the Federal Highway Administration doesn't recognize the quieter pavements as the, the answer to the sound. That's right. They still want to put the walls up, but we're really fighting for that, so hopefully we'll get it done one of these days. Yeah, that's right. No, they, they don't see it as a noise pollution mitigator. Right but it certainly provides a better user experience inside the vehicle. Very much so. Very um, much so. Mr. Tom Scullion here at TTI has done a lot of work in perpetual pavements as well, and he has worked with TxDOT in their pavement manual to include guidelines for perpetual pavement design. I reference it here. Uh, it will work through TxDOT's FPS 21 design software, which is readily available out there. So if, if we've got cities or counties or or other folks that are managing pavements in terms of pavement design and like, hey, where do I get some design software or what can work? TechSpots FPS 21 is out there. Mm -hmm. They do have a particular section related to perpetual pavements, where you could design, you know, any flexible pavement with FPS 21. It's a pretty user-friendly design software, I think. Mm -hmm. Truth there's Pave Express, there's, there's Per Road. There's Per, like per Road's ava readily available out right. there as well. So, and, and Dr. David Newcomb here at TTI did some work on developing that program. Right. So, it's it's a really good program. Texas FPS does have a few things that you need to think about if you try to do a perpetual pavement design in it. Um, if it's your first go around, I would suggest getting a little bit of help because it can be a little tricky making sure you get everything in it. But right. um, we can... We've done some kind of sensitivity analysis using FPS 21, and we found that we can create some designs that give us some realistic HMA depths that are very economically competitive. If we put the time of construction into it with how quickly we should be able to construct exactly. flexible pavements, and I say should be because it's important if, if you've got network managers out there on 
how do you want to work with your contracting community? What can you do from a contracting standpoint to incentivize them or penalize them? Truth be told, right? If they, right. If they don't go fast enough, there, there has to be a carrot and a stick. That's right. So we, we got to figure that part out. But um, speed of construction, working with a contractor to figure that out, and what is offered in flexible pavement construction is uh, it, it, the sky's the limit there. I want to show you just quickly a, a just this is just a real quick. We did a lot more than this, but this would be a an example of a perpetual payment design where we've got pretty high ADT. We're looking at 73 million easels over a 20 year period. That's a lot. Um, typically, we start talking about perpetual pavements at like 50 million easels and above right. after a 20 year period. 30% truck traffic. A couple of design options look like this, where we're talking about probably. 14 total inches of, of what I would call structural HMA, right. where you've got a, an SMA, which is going to be a really great rut resistant top layer. Then you have a really thick section that's going to disperse our load, that's right. make sure we get it good and spread out. That RBL layer, a lot of times we refer to that as a rich bottom layer. Right. It usually has a little bit higher asphalt content in it. It gives us a little bit of flex in the event that there is a little bit of bending between our asphalt layer and our base layer. There's some really smart folks out there, Tom Scullion included, that say, hey, honestly, if you make that middle layer thick enough and you get that load spread out enough and you have a really good cement treated base layer that you're building on top of, mm -hmm. that that rich bottom layer may not be required. I used a lot of rich bottom layer in Dallas. Uh, we used a lot of it for shoulder work. <laughs> and it's, it's man, we're talking about 20 years plus. Yeah. It's still performing quite well. So a lot of times we don't, see everybody using the rich bottom layer, but I did a lot of experimenting stuff up in the sure. Dallas area when I was there at TechStuff. I think it's something you can play with in your design. If, if you want to really try to thin that HMA layer up and maybe really push the envelope a little bit, mm -hmm. I would say you should think about it a lot because it will give you some extra flex in the bottom. The But as you go through this process and you think about constructability and how you want to build things, Compacting hot mix is very dependent on the ability of the layer underneath it to take the compaction effort required. Right. So when you design these uh, perpetual pavements or any flexible pavement at all, think about what you want to do to those unbound layers, your base layers and your subgrade layers. Can you treat them and should you treat them? On the should you, I would say most of the time the answer is yes. yes. Uh, it, it somewhat makes them a little bit more dummy proof as well. Finding good base material is is can sometimes be a challenge. Yeah. Finding the good blade operator that was there in 1984 That's right. is a little bit harder to do these days. So, you know, you drop 2% cement in it and, and you run it in there with a mixer and you stabilize that layer. It gives you something really good to compact against and make sure that hot mix layer as you come up from from bottom to top is, right. is what you want it to be to last for a long time. So, you know, if we stop the cracking below our hot mix asphalt, then it will never get into our hot mix asphalt. That's right. And, and ideally, we want to be spreading that load out that if cracking is occurring down there, it probably has something to do with water. That's right. And, and movement of water there, that it's not a load related crack down there. And that any cracking we see in a perpetual pavement is a surface crack that uh, that's most likely top down or begins in the top one inch of that pavement surface right there um, and, and is not necessarily a structural crack. And, and these designs, I think, can get you there. They can handle, you know, we're talking 75 million easels over a 25-year right. period, which is going to handle, you know, traffic on many of our interstates for a long time. For a, for a long time. Uh, and, and, and we think we can get there. So I think, hitting the wrong button yeah, over we here. we got some more pictures here. Yeah. yeah so these are, these are just some extra pictures. The bottom one's there from 114 in Fort oh, yeah. Worth. Yep. And uh, I think the Top two are from 35 in New Braunfels, I believe. So, well, there's your information there on the bottom left side. Uh, yep. So that's how you can get a hold of me. I've got an email there. I've got a, a telephone number. You know, you can go to tti.tamu.edu and look for people, and you can find people a lot smarter than me, <laughs> and their emails will be there, and uh, you can reach out to them if you've if you've got any questions about any number of things that we do here, not just. Uh, Flexible we're here, payments and professional. We're here to help. You can call us at uh, TexAPA and get a hold of you. If you'd like to talk to me or just email me, just it's W E L 
5151 at yahoo.com slash Larry Welch, W-E-L 5151 at yahoo.com. Uh, send me a text and I'll try to come out and visit you or look at your roads and help you out. And we can refer to people uh, that can be, uh, again, a lot smarter than I am. Charles, this has been fantastic. I want to thank you so much. The people here at TTI are so gracious and help us out. And we're all about the longevity in asphalt, good rides, safe, safe roads here in Texas. And uh, Dave Newcomb and yourself and uh, other people around here have just been so nice to me. And thank you very much for helping me out for my webinar today. Oh, you're very welcome. Thanks for the invitation. I appreciate it. And we thank you. Again, if you had some questions, you didn't want to put them on the chat, just give our office a call and tell them you uh, looked at the webinar today and you'd like to talk to me about some questions. So again, I appreciate it very much. This is Larry Welch, and we'll be signing off now. And we'll be looking for you on the 14th of November for our Liquid Asphalt webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we're